and good afternoon. I'm here to welcome you and of course Nick Cernicek for whom you are here on stage in a minute. I just want to introduce with a few words what and why we have Nick here today. Today, of course, Friday in Elevates Festival is our digital day, our day on net politics, on questions of power, and uh, regarding this year's general topic, of course, also the intricate relationships when it comes to AI, technology, democracy. We had psychology in the morning, later we will dig it deeper into, into, into economic questions, and this is where Nick is an expert on. He is a senior lecturer of, on digital economy in King's College London. Some of you might be familiar with his book on platform e economy from 2016, and out there you would have a chance to grab his latest book, which is uh, on the future of work, or rather, after work. Um, he, you co-wrote it with Helen Hestes. And uh, the question today, I mean, it's already here. Where is the value of generative AI? And is there? And where does it really come from? And is value a question of public value, maybe, rather than only looking at it from a private investor's perspective, which is currently kind of dominating the narrative around it, or at least this is how we perceive it to be. Much more on that by Nick. And just the technical details, there's of course a live stream. I welcome you people there. There will be of course a recording of this session in the archives. There's also Radio Helsinki and Radio Fabrik Salzburg who also transmit today's session. Nick, I love to say this phrase, without much further ado, I welcome you on stage. Warm applause. So, um, thank you for that nice introduction. Um, thank you everybody for coming out. Uh, and thank you to everybody who's helped organize um, this amazing festival. Um, today I'm talking about, as the slide suggests, where is the value of generative AI? Uh, which is a slightly different question than I think is often asked, which is what is the value of generative AI? Um, so, we've been in a period, I think over the past year and a half, since late 2022, uh, of massive hype over generative AI. Uh, late 2022, we had in particular two open public services launched to the public, um, ChatGPT most notably, uh, but also a, a slightly lesser known uh, thing called stable diffusion, uh, which allowed people to generate images with generative AI. And this is sort of at the heart of what generative AI is all about. It allows AI models uh, to meaningfully generate human-like texts images, audio, uh, and as we've seen recently with the release of the Sora model, uh, even video, 60-second um, video clips that at least have some uh, plausibility of, of being created by a human. Now, the promises that are being made about this technology are sky high. Um, people are talking about, you know, uh, economic growth at the level of 7%, you know, an unprecedented amount, uh, productivity increasing across the, uh, uh, the economy, um, all sorts of people's jobs thrown into disarray. Uh, and at the more sort of utopian speculative side, we even have people thinking, well, generative AI is going to lead to artificial general intelligence and the end of scarcity as we know it. So we'll move into a post-capitalist, post-scarcity world. Now, I think 2023, last year, is perhaps peak hype period for generative AI. I think in particular because the potential of this technology, the sort of magic of it was clear, but it was, it was suitably unclear about what it could actually do to allow all sorts of hype to build around it. So investors ended up pouring billions of dollars into the field. You've got venture capitalists throwing money into it. You've got big tech companies throwing money into it. Um, thousands and thousands of different AI models have been launched. Um, I think if you go on Hugging Face, you can get you know, tens of thousands of different generative AI models. Uh, and I think really importantly, AI supply chains have also become the focus of geopolitical interest over the past year or two. So a lot of effort by both the US and China to sort of secure their own AI supply chains, 
um, but also to block each other from their supply chains. So the US, for instance, not allowing um, the most advanced chips to go to China, China not allowing you know, some certain materials to uh, go to America. <laughs> So 2023 is peak hype, and I think 2024, we're going to see some dampening down of that hype, um, in part because I think this question still hasn't quite been answered. Where is the value? How do you make money with generative AI? And with the exception of NVIDIA, who makes the chips that run all of this stuff, um, generative AI companies have yet to prove that they can actually make a profit. Now, it's difficult to find information about this. The amount of money being made by this stuff, the amount of cost that it all involves, is typically very closed in, very trade secrety. Uh, but we do know that OpenAI lost more than half a billion dollars in 2022. So the year in which ChatGPT was released, they lost half a billion dollars. So the question I want to sort of look at is, well, where is all this money going to? We have billions of dollars going into this field. Where is it disappearing to? To do so, I want to try and lay out the landscape of generative AI as it exists. Now, this is a constantly changing field. Um, I'm, you know, I'm following this professionally uh, to try and write a book on it, and I struggle to keep up with all the changes going on in the field. There's some sort of new technological advancement almost every single week. There's new companies getting founded every single week. Uh, and there's all sorts of competition going on between the big tech companies and these small startups. I think, however, we can outline a few key elements and a few key dynamics um, which have consolidated over the past year and a half. So this brings me to the landscape of generative AI. And I think broadly we can talk about it in terms of four different layers. Uh, hardware, infrastructure, models, and apps. So let's begin with hardware. Hardware is, broadly speaking, the accelerator chips, um, which are training these models and running these models. Uh, and the most popular version, they're GPUs, um, but you also have things like TPUs, tensor processing units. Uh, you have ASICs, which are more specifically designed to do the, um, the, the calculations required uh, for things like uh, generative AI. Um, all sorts of different chips, though, and this is the hardware level. If we look at this layer, NVIDIA absolutely dominates it. Um, they have around 70% of the data center market for providing chips, which is where almost all of this stuff is being um, trained and run. Uh, and in fact, in quarter four of last year, uh, they saw a 400% increase in the amount of revenues for data center chips. So they are, um, I think just recently, they become a more valuable company than uh, Amazon and Alphabet. They're the third most valuable company in the world at the moment. And it's precisely because they dominate this layer. Um, they have almost monopolistic control over it. The next layer is infrastructure. So it's not just one chip which is running and training these models. Uh, instead, you have to connect thousands and thousands of these chips together. Uh, and that is incredibly complicated. It's a massive science in its own right. So you need a whole bunch of accelerator chips. Uh, to give you an example of the expense, uh, NVIDIA's latest chip cost $40,000. Uh, and you need, well, Facebook says they're going to buy 350,000 of them. Um, so do the calculations there. It's a huge amount of money being poured into these things. You also need to network them all together. You need special networking. You need high bandwidth memory. Uh, you need the buildings to house all of this stuff, along with the cooling and the water uh, and the energy. You need the real estate to put all this stuff on. So this is the infrastructure level. It's actually taking these chips, putting them all together into uh, the cloud computing layer, as it's known. When we look at this layer, it's dominated by three companies. Amazon has a massive share, Microsoft has a, a large and growing share, uh, and Google has uh, a significant share as well. You'll notice here that uh, there's only one Chinese company mentioned, Alibaba, um, who's been struggling with their cloud computing network. Um, but in the global market for cloud computing, it's almost all Western countries. Three Western countries in particular take 67% of the global market. Now, one key question at this layer, and I wanna, one of the things I want to do in this lecture today is sort of raise questions that are open in the field. So things which might change the future of 
AI, um, and things which might change the, the political economy of AI. So the first question is simply, will scaling laws continue to hold? Uh, now, scaling laws basically point to the fact that the advances in AI come from throwing more computing power at it. So a few years ago, one AI researcher wrote what was called the bitter lesson. And the bitter lesson is that for all the ideas that we have in our heads about humans inventing new, new ways to approach AI, new advances in artificial intelligence, and you know, putting all this knowledge into AI models, the bitter lesson is, in fact, the key thing which has allowed AI to develop is just throwing more computing power at it. So, you know, one of the things when we had uh, Deep Blue uh, beating chess masters, um, what wasn't that Deep Blue had some fantastic knowledge of chess. It was just that it could brute force comprehend all the possible moves and choose the best one. So this has continued on today. Um, the bitter lesson is just that we can throw more computing power at the problems of artificial intelligence, and it gets better. Now, this creates an imperative to grow larger and larger systems. Uh, like I said, Facebook is reportedly purchasing 350,000 of these chips, which is an unprecedented amount. And the idea is simply that this will allow them to solve all sorts of problems in the artificial intelligence space. If these scaling laws continue, then the imperative to expand compute continues as well. Um, so 350,000 uh, NVIDIA chips will be nothing in five years' time. Uh, we'll continue to expand these things. However, if scaling laws don't continue, then maybe alternative approaches will have some success. Maybe some smaller companies will have some success in this field. Now we get to the third layer of generative AI. Um, which is the models themselves. Now, in generative AI, they're all based upon a particular architecture called transformers. Um, this has been really popular uh, precisely because it allows these things to be trained on multiple GPUs at a time. So they can be trained with a huge amount of compute. Now, <laughs> when we look at what models actually are in practice, um, they can be as simple as just two files, two computer files, and that's it. Uh, one is a run code file of about maybe 500 lines of code, fairly simple. And the other is called the parameter file, which is effectively all the weights of the model. Um, so all the different neurons of these neural networks, each one has a different weight associated with it. And the parameter file lists all of that. It's a very big file. We're talking you know, hundreds of gigabytes. Um, but it's a very simple file. However, that file itself is the product of, at times, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment just to produce that one file. The parameters effectively taken uh, the internet, because we're effectively putting the entire internet into these models. It's compressed it down through training, and it's outputted this you know, couple hundred gigabytes file um, that contains a compressed version of the internet. Uh, as the sci-fi writer Ted Chiang put it quite eloquently, it's effectively a blurry JPEG of the web. Um, I highly recommend his piece in The New Yorker on this. It's a very, uh, I think, approachable uh, uh, introduction to generative AI. But so this is what the model layer is all about. Um, training these things, producing the parameters, the weights, which are absolutely essential, um, and then running them. Now, there's a couple of questions at this layer that I think are quite um, significant. The first one is simply, uh, can domain-specific models beat general foundation models. So general foundation models are what most of us are probably familiar with. Uh, so when you use ChatGPT, for instance, you're probably relying, if it's the free version, you're relying upon GPT 3.5. Um, it is a general foundation model. Um, unlike earlier AI, one of the advances of generative AI is that can do a lot of different things. So the same model can't just do one task, it can do multiple different things. Um, which is one of the benefits of generative AI. Now, these models are huge. They contain billions of parameters, possibly even a trillion or more parameters. We don't know um, because companies have stopped releasing that information, um, but they're very, very large. Now, specific models, domain-specific models by contrast, tend to be smaller, and they're trained on more curated data sets. So one, I think, really prominent example here is what's called Bloomberg GPT. So Bloomberg, the financial company, trained their own large language model. Uh, and what they did is they had some broad data sets, 
But then they also incorporated a lot of specific financial data sets into their model as well. So it was trained in such a way that it was supposed to understand the financial world better than GPT. Um, so specifically for use by financial companies and analysts. However, at the moment, it's not entirely clear which approach is better. So sometimes specific models seem to perform better than ChatGPT, GPT-4, uh, Gemini, whatever, whatever you're using. But other tests also show that GPT-4 can outperform, for instance, Bloomberg GPT. Um, GPT-4 has been shown to perform better than some specifically designed medical LLMs. And the idea here is that, well, once you start training these models at a certain scale, they start getting emergent capabilities, um, things which weren't quite predicted, and things which aren't available to a smaller model. So in fact, perhaps the future is going to lie in just building bigger and bigger models rather than trying to train them on specific data sets. Um, this might be the future. It's an open question. The second major question at the layer of models is, will open source win out or not? Um, one of the curious things about AI research over the past 15 years or so, until recently, has been surprisingly open. Most corporate research is pretty closed. Um, you can't find out, you know, uh, let's say materials research for a battery company or something like that. But AI research it published loads of information. DeepMind, for instance, published loads of information. Until recently, um, this has been increasingly closed down, in part because as we get more capable models, there's more concern about safety. So what does it mean to have GPT-4 widely available for anybody to use? Um, you know, fears about, for instance, creating bioweapons or fears about you know, using them to create hacking bots and things like this. So there's concern about opening these models to the public. But there's also the fact that as these models become more capable, they also become more valuable. So OpenAI doesn't want people to know how GPT-4 was trained. It doesn't want to know the scale of it, precisely because this is a competitive advantage over Google and over Microsoft even. So OpenAI has increasingly become closed AI. Uh, now, when we talk about open, open source AI, there's been a real flourishing of this in the past year. Um, particularly, uh, Facebook or Meta uh, released what was called uh, the Llama models. Uh, so they're on Llama 2. Llama 3 is going to be released in a little bit. Um, and these things are open source. They're widely available. They are transparent about what sorts of data are going into these models. Uh, they're transparent about the training methods. They're transparent about the parameters file, that key thing of, the, of the, the models. They're open about all of this, and people can then take it and use it freely. Um, so Meta is the most famous one, the Llama one, uh, but there's also the French company Mistral. There's Together, there's Stability, there's Eleuther AI. There's a bunch of other um, open source AI companies which have emerged over the past year or so. The question now is who's going to win um, between open source and between closed source? And this is a billion dollar question. Um, open source models in their favor are cheaper um, by their very nature. You can, any one of us, for instance, could go and take Llama's model, the Meta's Llama model, um, and go and run it on a sufficiently powerful computer. Um, you need a fairly expensive GPU to do it, but you can do it. Um, if you want a closed source one, you have to pay money to OpenAI. You have to pay money to Microsoft or Google. Uh, open source also has a community of people which are working on and developing these things. So finding new ways to improve these models, finding ways to add features to them, finding bugs and issues with them. However, open source also requires a lot more technical knowledge to use. Um, you know, ostensibly, we could all go run these models, but I imagine most of us don't have the technical knowledge to do that sort of thing. Same thing goes for companies. The other key thing is that open source remains behind the state of the art in terms of um, the, the capabilities of these models. So GPD-4 was released, I forget exactly when, but like almost a year ago now, um, and it is still the state of the art. Um, Google possibly, more capable at the moment, um, but no open source uh, model has come close. So if you want the best models to do the best things, you have to go to the closed source ones. The open source ones are simply not sufficient. Again, though, this is an open question. Who's going to win between open source and closed source? It's unclear. Um, curiously enough, I was just reading this morning, uh, Elon Musk has apparently sued OpenAI 
for not adhering to their foundational documents. Um, and one of the things he wants OpenAI to do uh, is to release, open source, all of their models. Um, so maybe there won't even be any closed AI models in the future. It'll just be all open. Who knows? All right, now we get to the last layer, apps. Um, this is the very top. This is the layer which um, we interact with as users, that businesses interact with. Um, this is the products and services built upon models. ChatGPT is an app. Um, it's based upon the GPT 3.5 model, um, but itself is the app that is that, um, accessible. Now, there's a bunch of different businesses being built on top of these models. Some simply provide an interface um, to another model. Uh, some provide more complex systems which link together a bunch of different models. Um, and then some of them, like Adobe, for instance, uh, have built models specifically for their use cases. So uh, Adobe's Firefly, for instance, um, is a, an image generator, image manipulation model. Um, but Adobe also has a real premium placed on not breaking copyright laws. And so their model has been trained on data which is entirely open, freely available, not running into any sort of copyright issues uh, like other image generators are running into. So these are the sorts of businesses which are being built. But again, it leads me to my opening question of what are the profitable use cases for generative AI? Um, if we look at how companies are using it, sometimes they're using it for customer service bots. But a problem with generative AI is that it's not trained to tell you the truth, it's trained to tell you the statistically most likely next word, um, which may or may not be the truth. Uh, so they're prone to hallucinating things in, in the technical jargon. They're prone to imagining and telling you a bunch of different wild things. So what companies are finding when they use these chatbots for customer service is that they're just making up absolute nonsense. Um, Air Canada, for instance, had a chatbot based on generative AI. Uh, somebody was interacting with it, asking about, oh, can I get a deal about, because um, uh, I've had a bereavement in the family, I need to travel. And the chatbot was basically like, oh yeah, here's a deal you can have. It wasn't actually a deal, uh, didn't exist. Uh, that got taken to court and Air Canada actually had to buy, uh, accept that deal that the chatbot had completely invented. Um, there was a car dealership in America which was trying to sell somebody a car for $1. Um, Again, I think uh, using generative AI for customer service bots is not going to work out. It's nonsense. Um, similar thing for training these things on company documents. Uh, the idea being that um, you know, you've got, say, an issue with uh, some sort of HR issue, and rather than searching through all the company documents to find the answer, you just ask the chatbot, you know, what is the answer? Again, they're just going to imagine answers. You know, they might tell you the truth at times, but at other times they're going to imagine complete nonsense uh, and lead to real issues for companies. It's not going to work. I think if we look at what companies are actually using uh, generative AI for, there's two real cases that seem to have gained significant ground. Uh, programming and advertising. Uh, so programmers are pretty widely, I think, using AI assistants to help them with their work. Sort of like the way you type on your phone and you've got autocomplete sort of suggesting you know, the next word. Um, it's similar to that. You're coding and these assistants will sort of finish off the code for you. Uh, so GitHub Copilot is probably the most popular one. They say that they have over a million users, pretty significant uptake, uh, and they importantly claim to be profitable as well. So there was a bit of a controversy about this uh, six months ago or so. Uh, the Wall Street Journal said that they had found uh, Copilot wasn't profitable, and Copilot came out and said, no, actually we are, we are profitable. Um, marketing companies are also using generative AI. They're creating, say, product images, product descriptions. Um, uh, you can, for instance, go to Google and generative AI will create a marketing strategy for you and things like this. So there seems to be ways in which, you know, truth is not necessarily as important as much as creation. Um, in these cases, uh, generative AI seems to be potentially useful. Uh, but again, it's unclear how much money is going to be made here. I think the other thing to note here is that if generative AI is only good at programming and advertising, this is a far way from the promises that have been made for generative AI. You know, we were promised the end of scarcity and we just got more ads. Um, it seems a bit disappointing. Um, is it really worth the tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars being poured into the field? I'm not sure. So, um, where is that money going to? Where is the value? 
Well, if we start looking into some of the financial aspects of these companies, um, these companies at the app and model layers, they are making some money. Uh, OpenAI is the most prominent one. Uh, they are reported to have hit uh, what's called an annualized run rate. So basically, how much money did they make in one month? Multiply that by 12. In December of 2023, they had a $2 billion annual run rate, which actually makes them one of the fastest growing companies ever. Um, to reach that amount of revenue uh, in, in the short period of time that they've had is extremely fast. So they've been wildly successful in terms of revenue. Uh, likewise, other AI companies like Anthropic, Perplexity, Microsoft Copilot, they're all clearly generating millions of dollars um, as well. So we know this. The issue is not so much revenue, though, as costs and the profits that emerge afterwards. And the costs of generative AI are sky high. So training these models is extremely and notoriously expensive. We don't know how much GPT-4 actually costs. Nobody has ever given an official figure on it. But Sam Altman has said at one point that it cost over $100 million to train GPT-4. A lot of money. That doesn't include the actual cost of the computer. So the computer itself, Microsoft spent hundreds of millions, I think the actual figure is around $250 million, uh, to build a supercomputer for OpenAI. Now, Anthropic, another major AI company, uh, said a while ago that they're going to spend $1 billion training a single model. Uh, again, this is a huge amount of money being put into this stuff. Uh, now, venture capitalists have noted that building a foundation model um, for a startup company means that 80 or 90% of your money is simply going to cloud companies. It's not just training, though. So you train the model, you produce this parameter file, you've got the model. It's also the cost of inference. This is actually running the model. So when you ask ChatGPT a question, uh, it's called, it does what's called inference. It you know, runs through the entire model, produces an answer for you. And it turns out that's even more expensive than training. It's not talked about as much, but it's actually more expensive. Again, trying to get actual figures on this is incredibly difficult. But one estimate uh, for OpenAI was that in the early years of 20, or the early months of 2023, they were spending about $700,000 per day on inference costs, which works out to about a quarter of a billion dollars per year. So yeah, they're making two billion in revenue, but there's training costs, there's inference costs, there's, that's just you know, computing costs. Um, Anthropic is spending about half of their revenue on computing costs. Um, and I think it's really important to note as well that open source AI doesn't escape these costs. So yeah, you can take Llama, you can use it on your computer, um, it still costs money. And if you want to serve an open source model to a million people, it's going to cost millions and millions of dollars to do that sort of thing. Wildly expensive. So a first answer to where is the value of generative AI is the infrastructure layer, the layer of the cloud computing giants. The money seems to be floating towards them. Um, and particularly because they control the access to the required computing infrastructure. We need their scale of compute to train these models, to run these models. So they have an immense amount of power within the AI supply chain, uh, and they're using it to generate um, a huge amount of money. There's also a dependency that's built into them. Um, so if you're a startup company, and you want to build a foundation model, um, you can't raise billions of dollars to build your own sort of cloud infrastructure. Um, it's not entirely impossible, but extremely unlikely, extremely difficult to do. So what AI startups are often doing is they're partnering with big tech. OpenAI Microsoft is the most well-known one, um, so they've been partners for quite a while now. Uh, but there's also Anthropic partnering with Amazon, there's Hugging Face with Google, uh, and there's some other sort of lesser known partnerships um, as well. Now, I'm going to put partners in quotations here because partners suggest an equal relationship, and that's not really what's happening here. Um, these partnerships are based upon a, a, a very asymmetrical power relationship between the cloud companies and the AI startups. So these partnerships often involve uh, exclusivity measures. So for instance, OpenAI uh, has to train on Microsoft, has to be run on Microsoft's computers. Uh, they can't go to alternative competitors. Um, startups typically aren't given actual cash to go and spend anywhere. 
Instead, what happens is they'll be given cloud computing credits. So it's basically like you know, Amazon giving you an Amazon gift certificate. Um, you, you can spend it, but you can only spend it at Amazon. Um, it's the same thing with OpenAI. They've got this money, billions of dollars, but they can only spend it on Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft, in their case, uh, in their deal, also has control over key intellectual property from OpenAI. Uh, and this became a really big issue when Sam Altman was pushed out of OpenAI because it wasn't clear if OpenAI was going to survive. And the big sort of thing that people were worried about was who controls GPT-4 then? Is it, does it stay with OpenAI or does it go with Sam Altman and the employees to Microsoft? And it turns out that most of the key intellectual property is actually controlled by Microsoft as well as OpenAI. Um, so this is, I think, um, a real uh, indication of the asymmetry of power um, that's involved in these partnerships. Okay, so um, values flowing towards these cloud giants. Um, but it's not just that it's flowing towards them. Um, they're also sort of encroaching on the other layers as well. So if we look at the infrastructure layer, we've got Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, a Amazon Web Services. That's the, the cloud computing giants. They're also all building their own chips. So Athena, Cascade, TPUs, Tranium, Inferentia, uh, all of these companies are starting to build their own uh, chips precisely to get away from NVIDIA's control over the market, um, but also to potentially um, uh, make these uh, chips more efficient um, than what the GPUs are. They're also producing their own models. Microsoft is producing uh, a number of different models. Uh, their core model remains GPT-4. They're very dependent on OpenAI for that. Um, but Google has produced uh, a, a massive amount of different models, uh, and AWS is starting to produce its own models as well. And then they're producing their own apps. So Copilot is the famous one from Microsoft. Gemini is the most recently uh, released one from Google. Uh, and AWS has a service called Q. It's apparently not very good, but it still shows that they are trying to integrate across these vertical layers. So the generative AI landscape, these four different layers, are not just dominated by um, these, these three key players in the infrastructure layer. It's increasingly being saturated by these three companies. They're coming to dominate every single level. On top of that, we have what I'm calling AI expansionism. Uh, AI infrastructure being actively pushed into all sorts of different areas across society um, and across our economy. So in healthcare, for instance, we have the idea of using generative AI as a sort of a, a assistant for doctors, um, using it to analyze you know, radiology scans and things like that. Um, in finance, it's supposed to help out sales teams. Um, it's supposed to you know, analyze financial data. Uh, in education, we have the promise of you know, chatbot tutors and things like that. Um, AI is being pushed into all these sectors. And again, this means that it's not just coding and ad companies that are going to be paying money to the cloud computing giants. It's going to be the multi-trillion um, uh, multi dollar healthcare market, which is paying money to cloud giants. The multi-trillion education uh, market, which is going to be paying money to the cloud giants. Um, and of course, the massive financial market, giving money towards these cloud giants. Um, I think this is where the role of generative AI hype plays a part. Because the promise is, well, it will dr dramatically change your business and that you need to get onto it as soon as possible. Buy our services, pay for our infrastructure, um, roll out this stuff, integrate it into your businesses, and then become dependent on us. So a lot of this hype, I think, is part and parcel of this AI expansionism. For me, one of the most worrying parts, though, is the growing state AI nexus, um, which isn't really talked about in part because of the national security nature of it, but AI is being pushed very much into the military sector, into security agencies uh, around the world. Um, in January of this year, for instance, OpenAI quietly rescinded their ban on using their products for military and warfare purposes. Um, it took some investigative journalists to notice this. Soon after, though, it was also reported that OpenAI was working on a number of projects with the Pentagon. Um, unsurprisingly, not coincidentally. I think OpenAI is very late to the game here, though. Um, Amazon already has massive contracts, multi-billion dollar contracts with the US government. Um, Microsoft, the same thing. Google, the same thing. They're all integrating themselves into the core functions 
of the state as we know it. Uh, and I think there's a growing mutual dependency, in fact, um, between these massive tech giants um, and the state as we know it. Um, the state needs the technology of these giants, but these giants also need the multi-billion dollar contracts that come from providing you know, services for the Pentagon and stuff like that. So for me, this is worrisome because I think it shows a growing convergence of interest between these two. Um, and as we start to see you know, geopolitical um, hotspots emerge around the world, whether in the Middle East, whether in Ukraine and Russia, whether potentially in Southeast Asia, all of this stuff, I think, um, it bodes ill for the future if there is convergence here. So to summarize here, um, I think what we're seeing is a growing field of AI dominance. Um, control over compute as a key resource for artificial intelligence, as a key resource for the digital economy, as a key resource for the global economy, is being used to expand control across the economy into all of these new different sectors. Even if the generative AI hype turns out to be nothing, even if it only makes you know, slightly better ads and maybe some easier programming, AI is still becoming more and more capable. And I think we need to think about what happens next. Um, you know, one of the big fields of research at the moment is for agents. So sort of quasi-autonomous little AI people who can go and perform a variety of different actions um, for on, on your behalf. Integrate this with the advances in robotics that we're starting to see. So there was a massive um, investment in a robotics company just a few days ago from, uh, I think it was OpenAI, Microsoft, NVIDIA, um, and Jeff Bezos. And it's precisely because once you start mingling AI in with the physical world via robots, you start getting a whole new slew of possible use cases. All of this remains controlled, though, by three companies as it stands. And one of the core problems here is that the direction of development, what sorts of technologies we're making, uh, the choices of deployment, you know, what is being adopted, what is being pushed out, and the drivers of expansion, the search for more data, the search for more profit, the search for more power, all of these decisions lie in the hands of just a few companies. Um, that, to me, seems immensely problematic. I don't have an easy answer to this problem, um, but I think trying to outline the scale of the problem and the nature of the problem uh, is an important first step. Thank you very much. Very much for your very solid and uh, well-grounded, well-rounded introduction of yeah many pitfalls to yeah which have been kind of overlooked and uh, the amassing of power, especially of yeah you named the few. I, I'm not going to repeat them. Yes, but what is it that you want to ask, Nick? Is there any questions that we could open our question and answer session with, or should I? Go ahead. There is a microphone coming. Or, Nick, we just dive a little deeper. Yeah, you have a question. Olena, sorry, I was thinking you were hiding the phone, so the microphone. Also, I'm also responsible for the microphones, but I also have a question. As a starter, Nick, how many um, images in your presentation were generated by Olena? <laughs> I did make a conscious decision to try and use quite a bit, actually. Um, yeah, uh, uh, they weren't generated by me because I'm too lazy to go and try and finesse this. But um, uh, yeah, there's probably like 10 or so, maybe a third of them were generated by AI. Yeah. I want to, oh, there is a hand. OK. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering uh, why we always see just the American giants and very little information about uh, China and the Asian market. I mean, I know that we are basically blank in Europe, but or there are some, but not comparable. But Asia seems to be missing in all the uh, reports and everything. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think so. The focus is on the Western giants because they have just so much power. They're, they're scale above and beyond anything else. Um, Europe has Mistral is probably their best hope. Um, but of course, Mistral, I think just last week, signed a partnership with Microsoft. Um, proving that dependency on big tech. Um, and it's not surprising, you know, Mistral needs compute, Microsoft has compute. Um, with China, it's curious because they have the technology companies which have the potential, um, but 
there's been, for a variety of reasons, challenges with their cloud computing companies, um, particularly sort of expanding outside of China. Um, they've not quite been able to reach the scale that um, the American giants have been able to do. So they have less compute available to them. Um, the other thing with generative AI is that because it's prone to repeating what it's got in its data set, because it's pr prone to making things up, there's a lot more concerns about censorship um, and what it's saying in China than elsewhere. Um, now, the tech giants have had to deal sort of with their own versions of that, you know, making sure that racist and sexist biases aren't expressed through these machines. Um, but I think the Chinese government has been particularly concerned about the potential of these AI models to... Um, Hallucinate democracy? Yeah, yes. Um, yeah. Hallucinate <laughs> democracy and potentially, you know, bring it into life. Um, yeah, so there's, there's, there's concerns there, and I think the, the tech giants have been hindered um, either explicitly or because they know what the government wants and they know what they're not allowed to do without the government ever explicitly having to state that. Um, but they know that there's potential issues there. So it's hindered the development of generative AI, I think, to, to some extent. Um, yeah, and the other, the other aspect is the English language nature of the tech giants mm -hmm. um, has allowed them to expand around the world much more rapidly than a Chinese language first one. Um, so I think this is another key aspect um, of their expansion and why the focus is on them so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There is a raised hand in the second row. Thank you. I also work in the education system and I'm very worried about the expansion of AI because, I mean, it becomes quite senseless to make students write an article, for example. Um, but are you, what, what's your stance on that? Mm. Are you just worried about the tendencies of monopolization or do you see any value in itself in AI? Thank you. So I, I'll start with the value, I think, of AI. I think it can be quite useful. Um, I mean, so I've used generative AI, for instance, when I'm, uh, you know, I've got a difficult concept that I want to explain to students and I'll ask, you know, ChatGPT, can you give me some analogies or some examples of this to, to provide for students? And I've got the expert knowledge to be able to say, okay, that analogy doesn't quite work or things like that. But it helps, it's helped me a lot alleviate sort of that, um, that pedagogical burden of finding examples to explain to students. Um, so I think there are uses mm -hmm. for it. And I think the, the sort of personalized nature of chatbot tutors could be quite good. The challenge is in avoiding those hallucinations, and I'm not sure how much that can be avoided. The problems, I think, have to do with, yeah, for assessments, students just using ChatGPT to write, to, to write things. Um, for me, the real issue is the incentive structure that drives students mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. um, because grades become the sole focus um, of everything, you know, of, of their next job, mm -hmm, of, you know, mm -hmm. are they going to get into a graduate school or anything like that? And then, you know, some modules, um, some classes, you know, if your grade is just one single essay, there's a lot of pressure to get as good as possible on that. Um, even before ChatGP, and I'm sure you've experienced this and every educator's experienced this, students were already optimizing for the assessments, for the grade. So, you know, I would have students that would show up only for the lecture that was going to appear on the essay. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, avoid every other lecture. It was a waste of their time. Um, so there's already the incentive structure for students to do that. They've optimized for it. ChatGPT, to me, is just the latest expression of this problem. I think it makes it much worse, mm -hmm. um, but I think the problem goes beyond that, you know. We have to think about how to incentivize students not to optimize for a grade, but how to go to school to, to learn, uh, to desire to learn. Because the problem is not with students who are there to learn. The students who want to learn are not going to use ChatGPT to write an essay. They want to actually work through the issues. Um, it's the ones who are solely there for a grade who are just like, well, I don't want to have to take all the time to learn this. What can I just, you know, what's the easiest way through? Um, so yeah, I think it's a big problem with the very nature of education as it exists right now. You know, what is it for? Mm -hmm. uh, and in too many parts, it's like job training, basically. Mm. Thank you for that one. Um, makes me think of a question, but there is a hand over there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it appears that uh, most of the decision making is done uh, among three groups of CEOs, perhaps the government, a convolution of them. 
Um, and the main topics appear to be business, profit making, okay, programming, defense, healthcare at best, education perhaps. How much, but there was a lot of really precious reflections, experiments, and um, yeah, a healthy critique delivered by the realm of arts, humanities, philosophy, critical thinking, sociology, anthropology, and so on. A lot of good papers, projects, uh, research, uh, also European public funded and so on, and American funded, I guess, as well. How much is this reflected within these CEOs? How much is this taken on board? I think the marketing team probably picks it up. <laughs> I'm not sure about the CEOs. To sugarcoat the whole... Uh, if you, yeah, if you look at if you look at OpenAI's marketing around education, it's, it pronounces all these glorious, uh -huh. great things. Um, if you look at their actions in it, it's, it's quite significantly different. Um, you know, uh, promising to provide personalized tutors to everybody in the world. You know, it's a, um, a lower zero cost sort of thing. Um, that's not what they're doing in practice, of course. Uh, I think Khan Academy is one of the biggest partners with OpenAI. Khan Academy provides you know, sort of online learning, and it's providing, trying to provide this personalized chatbot, and they're paying a load of money to OpenAI for the privilege of doing that. Um, so, yeah, I think the CEOs don't really care. Um, it is curious that at these upper echelons, the governance structures are not traditional, let's say. Um, we saw that with OpenAI when Sam Altman was kicked out and then let back in. You know, the very nature of OpenAI is that it's uh, a capped profit company. Um, it's not a sort of company which is searching after a quarterly profit all the time. Um, it is the company which has sort of ostensibly social goals in mind as well. Uh, Meta, Facebook is another good example because the way it's structured is Mark Zuckerberg has all the power. Um, so he doesn't have to bow down to quarterly pressures to make money. Uh, which is why I think they've been able to open source stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you look at investors' calls with um, Facebook, they're like, well, how are we going to make money by open sourcing? And, you know, Mark Zuckerberg sort of gives some answers, but ultimately, he doesn't have to care. Um, he doesn't have to care if he makes money or not because um, he's doing it for alternative reasons than necessarily a, a quarterly profit. So it's, it's, there is a strong incentive to focus on quarterly profits and maximizing those things by Microsoft in particular, by Google to a lesser degree. But OpenAI is curious and Facebook is curious in that way as well. So it's, it's difficult to say. Thank you. Another question? Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you for your very uh, interesting talk and pointing out where the value actually is and not what. Um, I would last, like to ask a very Austrian-German, maybe European question. Uh, what's your opinion on regulating this whole thing? I mean, obviously there are risks, mm -hmm. and uh, if we think about the free market and military, maybe there are some dystopian things that pops in the mind that you want to don't see in the future. <laughs> so is it even possible to regulate, or is it useful? It, it is possible to regulate. I think. Open source makes it difficult. Um, and this is one of the big concerns about mm -hmm. Llama being released into the wild is, well, yeah, now anybody can use a, a very capable generative AI model to do all sorts of things. Um, I think the real issues are not so much with AI as it exists right now. You know, the, the studies I've seen have suggested that if you ask generative AI to teach you how to build a bioweapon, for instance, it's about what you can get by searching the internet if you know where to look. Um, so it's, it's, you know, access to the knowledge is not the real hurdle here. Mm -hmm. It's regulating um, access to the materials, for instance, and regulating the ways in which these things are put together. So there's other ways in which we can do that. I think for me, the real concerns come around um, AI's use in the military, um, AI is used when it's embodied in robotics. Uh, AI when agents are actually sort of meaningfully possible. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, once we get to those levels, there's a whole new series of regulatory questions that open up that are not discussed whatsoever by the AI Act, for instance, mm -hmm. um, or you know, Biden's executive order on this mm -hmm. stuff. Um, I think we need to be thinking about those sorts of questions now. 
because DeepMind and OpenAI right now are focusing their research on agents. That's what they want to build. That's, I think, the next mo big uh, money maker for them. Um, so what happens when they, when they are successful? And I think they, they probably will be. We need regulations for that sort of thing. You know, how do we have accountability for uh, uh, an AI agent that goes rogue? Um, it's, it's really unclear. We haven't even solved that for driverless cars, let alone you know, AI agents running amok on the internet. Um, so yeah, I think we have a chance to get ahead of regulations by thinking about these questions now, but um, yeah, policymakers need to, to start now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, what about the copyright issues in some of these models? You mentioned, for example, Adobe and Firefly. So there are already some lawsuits, um, but what do you think is going to come out of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know how the lawsuits will turn out. Um, the copyright industry is powerful, um, particularly in America. You know, it killed Napster, my, my childhood sweetheart. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's powerful when it wants to be. Um, and it's been, you know, the entire U.S. strategy over the past 20 years or so has been enforce intellectual property and enforce copyright to an increasingly stronger degree. And now suddenly generative AI mm -hmm. seems to require ignoring all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a real tension about different corporate interests between generative AI and between the, the people producing the content. Um, I don't know who's going to win. I think what we're seeing emerge is um, just in the past two weeks, we've seen multiple deals between um, OpenAI and I think Tumblr, um, mm -hmm. Google and Stack Overflow, Google and Reddit, basically big tech companies paying these companies for their data, mm -hmm. which I think is probably the near-term solution. Um, fine for big tech, they have the money to be able to afford these things. Um, I forget exactly how much Reddit's deal was, I think $60 million a year. Fine for them. Um, if you're a startup and now you have to pay training costs, inference costs, plus data costs, I don't think you stand any chance. Like your narrow margins, if you had any margins, are disappearing very rapidly. Um, so to me, you know, I can see the value of recognizing copyright, but it also means that the startups are going to have that much more struggle to to compete against big tech companies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, I have another question. Uh, could you please comment on the impact on the environment from the generative AI? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's immense. It's immense. Um, uh, it's hard to get precise estimates, but you know, the, 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 a huge amount of electricity goes into running the data centers. A huge amount of water is used to cool these things because they run at extremely high temperatures and you have to keep them cool. Um, and yeah, so every data center is basically sucking up electricity and water from the area around it, um, which is maybe fine in some locations around the world, mm. but you know, there's data centers placed in many regions that are um, facing droughts and scarcity of water already. And now instead of, instead of water going to households, it's going to power data centers. Same thing with electricity. Um, I'll give you an example from London. Uh, London, in West London, um, in certain areas, certain neighborhoods, you're no longer allowed to get permission to build new housing because the electricity grid has been filled up by data centers. So this is, I think, a clear example. You know, London needs more housing, but we don't have enough electricity because of the data centers. Um, so this is, I think, a real um, uh, tension, a political tension. And the, the scaling laws I talked about, they demand more computing power. Um, they demand these things to grow larger and larger. There's a lot of efforts by these companies to make it more energy efficient, to make it more water efficient, but they're outpaced by the growing demand for these things. So, um, you know, you've got Microsoft right now is putting data centers underwater as a way to cool them. Um, they've got little shipping containers that they drop underwater. Um, Microsoft is investing into nuclear power. So perhaps these companies will start running nuclear power plants in the near-term future. Um, they already run massive renewable energy sources um, precisely to power their data centers, which is another interesting you know, mm -hmm. extrapolation of these co uh, companies to you know, the energy sector now. They're, in fact, running energy infrastructure. Um, but yeah, it's all driven by these scaling laws. If you want the best AI, you need to expand computing, you need to use more electricity, you need to use more water. Um, 
And there doesn't seem to be any near-term end to that. Now that you just mentioned infrastructure, I was to check in one question. You also think about potential positive visions regarding technological applications, and especially from the perspective of society, societal value. Um, are there ideas, what are the ideas you would rather have our governments, for instance, look after when it comes to either regulating, but also making it more beneficial generally to use those technologies? Yeah, I mean, I think a, a very first step can simply be pushing for workers to have more say over how this technology is used. Um, you know, the, 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 the actor strike and writer strike in America was quite an interesting example. Um, you know, key within the debates in Hollywood was about the use of generative AI to create scripts for Netflix. Um, and the actors and writers went on strike about that um, to prevent that from happening. And it became part of the you know, negotiating deal in the end was how can this stuff be used that respects uh, the livelihoods of the workers who are actually going to be affected by it. I think similar things have to go on in every single workplace because AI without worker oversight is going to mean more surveillance. Um, I got an email yesterday from my workplace. They want me to install a little surveillance app onto my phone so they can monitor everything. No way. Um, but this is the sort of thing which is going to happen everywhere. Um, more surveillance, more intensification of work. You're going to be asked to work harder, work faster, work longer. Uh, more pressures on like increasing productivity. Workers have to be able to have a say over how this technology is actually integrated. So they need to go on strike if necessary. They need to organize with unions, build unions in sectors which aren't you know, organized in that way, um, and, and demand to have a say over this sort of thing. I think that's something which can be done right now. And I think in a more sort of utopian way, we can also think about, well, actually, the productivity increases from AI we can use to reduce the amount of work that we have. No. Finally. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, um, a three-day working that. weekend uh, as a, a sort of a, a start, um, which is being, at least in the UK, is being picked up by a lot mm -hmm. of companies already. Yeah. Um, there was a massive trial of the four-day working week in the UK, um, and it's been wildly successful. Um, it was a trial to start with, and I think something like 60% of the companies have continued it on afterwards. They've made it permanent, uh, this four-day working week. Um, and if we get productivity increases from something like artificial intelligence, it makes sense to spread those benefits around by giving people more free time. Um, I think more free time is one of the key things we should be demanding at the moment. In order to organize and to socialize. Yes, exactly. It's also time. And sleep. And sleep. So we would have the chance for a last question or a last comment by you. Is there another raised hand? So, yes. Here with the lady with the head. Hello, Edda. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you so far. Uh, I have a question if you have any kind of vision on the psychological impacts um, we will be confronted with since uh, we are all human beings still and we have our needs and we need company, we need to talk, we need to be seen, we need to be heard by other people, not by a machine. Um, so what's your take on that? I think it's really difficult. Um, I think one of the more curious use cases for AI is precisely as a, a sort of personal companion. Um, you have companies like Inflection and Character, which, uh, and Replica as well. Um, these are companies which are focused on generative AI as a personal companion, um, not as somebody to like ask questions or develop you know, lesson plans or marketing strategies, but simply as somebody to talk to. And they seem to be pretty popular. And I think the knee-jerk reaction is to say, it's fake, you know, it's not real, we should get rid of it. But I think, I think the better question is asking why people are drawn to it. Mm. And, you know, what are they not getting elsewhere um, that's leading them to this circumstance? Um, I, I don't think there's an easy answer to it. I don't think the answer is to say, no, nobody should use these things. I think we need to be thinking about the way, structures, the way society is structured that's leading people to want to use these sorts of things. You know, there is, in many countries, an epidemic of loneliness. There's been lots of evidence about sort of lack of socialization amongst younger generations. Um, what are the core driving problems of that, mm -hmm. rather than you know, banning the use of these things? Um, yeah, I think that's the question to be asking. 
Thank you. Thank you for, yeah, this kind of outlook and also one of the reasons why we gather here in person and take time to think and also talk through. And if you have fear of missing out on some of the conversations, there's books to be read, uh, also some good help. So, yeah, it's just to say thank you once more. We, we had three times to ask him to <laughs> finally join our stage, and I'm very happy you did. Thank you, Nick. Thank you.